We've talked about LIGO in many different videos on this channel, including interviews with two of its three Nobel Prize winning leaders, Ray Weiss and Barry Barish. And I hope to get Kip Thorne on for a new video sometime soon. So that's great. And yeah. you learned more from that than you could imagine. Today, we're gonna to talk about LIGO, not as a detector of gravitational waves, as if that weren't great enough. We're gonna talk about it as a way of detecting dark matter. Let's go. We're gonna be discussing this paper, which describes advanced LIGO and LISA, a future space-born version of LIGO, as ways to detect dark matter by Evan Hall and Nancy Agarwal. This is looking for what's called a scalar field, ultralight dark matter candidate, which have become popular. We're combining together two different great mysteries, very sensitive gravitational wave detectors, not used for gravitational wave detection, and exotic candidates for dark matter, the most mysterious form of matter energy in our whole universe, makes up 80% of the matter in the universe, and yet we only know of one possible candidate for dark matter, and that's the neutrino. I've talked about that in this video, called dark matter already detected. But in that video, I explained that it's not possible for the observed number of neutrinos and their observed masses, or the limits that we have on their masses, to account for the amount of dark matter that there is in the universe. There either has to be another form of dark matter, or as we discussed with Mordecai Milgram and with Stacy McGaw, there must be a modification to the laws of gravity. Two different, completely bipolar opposites in terms of explanations. This experiment could get down to the heart of what's called a particulate candidate for dark matter. So a so-called scalar field described by the mathematics shown here could account for dark matter if there were sufficient abundances of these dark matter scalar fields to close the gap between the ordinary matter like the kind that we're comprised of, baryonic matter, and the missing amount known as dark matter. These types of scalar fields change what's called the fine structure constant, which is the governing parameter that controls the size and the force of interactions between electricity, magnetism, and what are called photons. The strength of electromagnetism in quantum mechanics is governed by the fine structure constant. The name fine structure dates to early spectroscopists from the late 1800s finding in the spectrum of glowing hot hydrogen gas when observed that there were strange lines that needed to be accounted for. These were later discovered to be part of what's called the program of quantum electrodynamics by Richard Feynman and others who found the solution for what the fine structure constant was, its value, but we don't know what it is, why it is what it is. In fact, it has the value at ordinary circumstances of about one divided by 137, which leads many physicists to set the number 137 as their combination on their luggage locks for the TSA. Now, if there were a light scalar field, it would change the size of the atoms, which is parameterized by the same fine structure constant. And it would do so in a periodic fashion, in a way that LIGO could detect, given its exquisite sensitivity to tiny variations in the size and scale of its cavities, of its laser lock cavities that we'll describe in just a moment. So you could measure the frequency of a laser as it oscillates inside of a solid, and it would be exquisitely sensitive to the change of the atomic radius, which would then, if shown to be pure periodic varying sinusoidally as shown in the first equations, that would be evidence for a scalar field which could then have an associated mass which could then possibly account for the amount of dark matter which we observe, we don't observe the dark matter itself, but we observe that there must be dark matter in the universe. Do this the scientists are using LIGO but not using LIGO to detect gravitational waves. It's using the phenomenal construction of what are called the test masses and the lasers cycling within it. This is from the LIGO team, how the so-called silica cavities, we have two different cavities that we're looking at. We have the fused silica cavity, which is called a reference cavity. And then there'll be an interference pattern, which will be generated at a modulated rate that will oscillate periodically if this dark matter scalar field exists and that will change the uh, effects of the interferometric pattern, so-called correlation function. And that's what they're looking for. So any strain, which is what LIGO looks for, it has this, what's called a strain sensitivity, is what how you uh, account for its performance. Any noise in the signal, or any signal that is caused by the dark matter will cause an oscillation difference between the signals in the reference cavity and the signals inside the control signal. So the dark matter could induce a strain, which would be periodic, unlike it wouldn't be random, like jittery 
noise of thermal vibrations or agitation from diurnal effects and things like that on much longer time scales. These would be much shorter and LIGO is well positioned to measure it. So thermal noise is random. It doesn't repeat periodically the way that a putative dark matter signal could. I heard a ruckus. Could you describe the ruckus? Here's a graph of their sensitivity, which is really the ratio of the signal to noise. So the noise is characterized here. So now there's two different LIGO instruments, two different L-shaped interferometers. One is in Livingston, Louisiana, and the other one's in Hanford, Washington. The Hanford one is far better for this particular type of measurement, has 10 times lower noise across the wide spectral band. And these aren't like exactly exotically extremely high or extremely low frequencies. These are audio frequencies that you could hear with your ears. Listen, you smell something? And again, what they're looking for is to scan over these different frequency terms and see if it's possible for them to discern and pick out of this forest of lines that comprise the noise background to see a modulated in time signal consistent with the dark matter canon. So here's their ultimate limit. We won't go through the math. There won't be any homework for this. Uh, you can read the paper if you're interested in more of the details. But this is uh, describing in this paper the limits that they could get to with more and more measurements. And then eventually, a much quieter location with lower Brownian motion from thermal noise and lower vibrational noise from not being located on the Earth is the lease emission shown here, a conceptual design of it. This could be launched in the next decade or so. And then this could lead to a limit on the mass, which is characterized as all particle masses are characterized by, by their electron volt energy divided by the speed of light squared. This is just relating their rest mass energy, E equals mc squared, dividing by c squared and getting the equivalent mass. So the researchers found they could use LIGO's laser frequency in the reference cavity and the interferometer itself to measure the coupling of an ultralight scalar field dark matter candidate to the standard model particles. These would be the particles like the electrons in the crystal inside the, the cavities that make up the actual cavities themselves. Those are just made of ordinary matter. They're not making it out of exotic dark matter or unobtainium. That's the only reason. They don't require any special runs of the instrument. They can get this in real time as LIGO is catching the behavior of exploding black holes. <laughs> of exploding supernovae perhaps, coalescing neutron stars, and especially its main most productive source of discovery, which are coalescing black holes. It can do this search for dark matter at no cost in time, sensitivity, error budget. It can do that search at the exact same time. So it's very efficient use of this exquisitely sensitive and pricey instrument. It costs about a billion dollars over its 20 or so year lifetime. So stay tuned. We may ultimately get the best possible data on these ultralight dark matter candidates, not from this ground-based instrument, but from space, the LISA instrument. Stay tuned for more information about that. And if you'd like to learn more about LIGO, click this video here, and I'll see you in the next episode.